Uh, my name is Dave Prone. I am the managing partner of Lightwave Venture, and we focus on uh, the, the company focuses on helping people develop commercialization opportunities for photonics. In the last 14 years, when I've been consulting, I've consulted for 116 companies, 115 in photonics, one on Latin hip hop music, but that's another story. But I've learned from looking not just from my perspective of what it was like for me, but what it was like through the eyes of 115 other companies. Usually I work at the senior management level and uh, I've got a lot of experience directly and indirectly in, on how to, to commercialize opportunity, how to raise money, how to write a business case, how to deal with government contracts, the commercial, commercialization aspect on an SBIR. And I think that experience I'd like to convey so that others don't have to make the same mistakes I do. I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I've learned a lot more from, from mistakes than successes. And I think you have to take the time to analyze the failures and why they didn't work so you don't make them again. I think the biggest mistake and the business reason for business failures are two. Uh, a lot of the stuff will generate here out of technology. And the technologist says, this is, this is the greatest mousetrap everybody, anybody's ever built and people will rip the walls off my building to get it. Well, I had really great stuff and there was not, not one scratch mark on the front of the building to people to get it. We had to go sell it. So I think most businesses fail because if they've done a poor job in marketing and understand the market dynamics, or they've done a poor job in manufacturing. So I didn't realize how profound it was. The day I became the CEO of EOTech, my boss at Exxon took me upstairs to the top of the Exxon building, which was in New York City, across from Radio City Music Hall. And he said, no matter how smart you are, you're not smart enough. No matter how uh, good you are, you're not good enough. Hire people that are better than you and smarter than you and ride the wave. So I have learned over the years not to be threatened by people, but to hire people that are really as good as I can find them and manage them, get out of their way. My job is to be at the front of the boat and block all the things that come at them so that they can do their job. That's the lesson I've learned. Anybody in a company, a big company, a small company, a startup, a mature company, if they learn the skills of an entrepreneur can be beneficial to the company. But not everybody can be a true entrepreneur because a true entrepreneur is one that has to be able to take risk and has to be decisive. I mean, if you get into an analysis paralysis and you can't make a decision, you will kill the company. So it's important that for it to be a true entrepreneur, if you want to be the CEO, you want to start it, you want to be in a founding group, that you've got to be able to withstand the risk. And you've got to make, you have to be decisive, but you, you don't want to make foolish decisions. And you have to be able to be thoughtful about what you do, but you don't want to be caught in a situation where you can't make the decision. That, that, that's a, that is the, uh, the path to failure. I think government funding is, has been very significant over the years, but most people don't realize that government funding has a long gestation period. A lot of the stuff that's happened, uh, it looks like it's new technology, was based on government contracts 20 years ago. The gestation period is usually fairly long. Uh, and you also got to be careful with government funding like SBIRs and STTRs, that they're focused on a government need. And while there's a commercialization section in the phase three of these programs is commercialization, getting a, a commercialization partner, uh, a lot of the problems these governments are one-offs. They are very specific to a government need. And I think you got to be careful when you work in these areas that you make sure that you are taking something that is supplementing your research. It, uh, there are plenty of places in the government funding where it directly helps build a whole platform. But in many cases, it's very specific and you've got to be careful to make sure that that fits in with an overall business case. And I help people do that. Technology in search of a problem is not focused. A problem that exists and finding a technology to fit it is more focused. So I think it's very important to understand the applications, number one. Number two, to answer that question in more detail, I encourage people, now this is not a business case that everybody likes, and I've been with certain people that want a pure play. I like opportunities that are more diversified. One development, one technology platform, multiple markets. So you can address multiple markets. So it's engineering problem to move to different markets. It's not a fundamental development problem. I think the companies where I've been an angel investor in 11 companies, the companies that are more diversified have done much better than the ones that are focused. Because no industry stays hot for, you know, forever. The telecom boom, photonics was a hot button. You know, you, they, it was every, you know, photonics was this, you know, telecom was the new, a new paradigm shift of the way we were going to do everything in the world. And I think a lot of the venture money got burned by high, va high valuations. I think that, that it, it, things are a little more realistic now. And, uh, I think there was still a good opportunity to start the business, but I think it's, it's, you've, you've got to be careful, or you've got to be 
thorough in how you do your business case to justify it. I've spent a lot of time helping people get out of telecom and diversify into other markets. I think in this point and where I am now, I will continue that, but I'd like to, to push more into the, really the hardcore commercialization, get into more of the mode of helping them raise money, uh, helping them develop the business case. That's where I tend to focus, and I think that's a real gap. Well, I think automation, you know, is, is you need less workers and you, and you de-skill. It goes back, there's a term called Fordism. Ford, Henry Ford, talked about de-skilling the workforce so that you can manufacture and you didn't have to do, make decisions on the job. I think the jobs picture will change. I think it would require more training. When you, if you're doing more automation, you're doing a more automated test, then you will need people that can, that can service that. So I think the job picture will change. It will be harder and harder for people without training to find jobs, though. I think that education will be a critical part of this. I see people going into the medical field. I see people going into a lot of fields. But maybe one in 20 goes into the sciences, into the real sciences, and that's a problem. Uh, and I, I think that we will pay the price for that because a lot of the innovation is going to come from technology.